Hello, everyone. This is Piero San Giorgio, author of Survive, the Economic Collapse. Today, I have the great pleasure to host on my channel, Paul from uh, Apex Mindset. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you doing, Piero? Good. Uh, so my audience, mostly French, mostly in Belgium, but also in Canada, in Quebec and Switzerland. So hopefully those who listen to us are English uh, speakers or understand English. Um, perhaps... Can you can you introduce you to them so that um, and then I'll tell why why I think it's really nice that we talk together tonight. Okay. Um, yes. Well, first I, I'll say I, I'm sorry that I can't do this in French for your audience. Um, I'm a little limited, unfortunately, with my language. So hopefully that'll work out okay for everybody. Uh, I started Apex Mindset kind of on accident, really. I was a military person. I worked in the infantry and special forces in the U.S. military. And part of what I did besides going out and doing missions and fighting terrorism, all that kind of stuff, was taking care of soldiers. As a non-commissioned officer um, in the United States military, it's our job to make sure our soldiers are ready for, for combat, for missions, and for deployments, which means that I look at the entire soldier in his mental state and how he's doing and how his family life is, how he is financially, make sure that he has everything set up at home. If he has a family or a girlfriend or wife or whatever, so that he can perform and do his job overseas and not have that extra stress, which can be a, a, that extra stressor can be a killer for guys when they go to combat in the process of doing that. I ran into a lot of toxic and problematic relationships for guys. And I became known as kind of the, we could say the girl or woman whisperer because guys had started realizing as I advised them on the relationships that I knew what I was doing with relationships and women. And so then they started bringing me their issues and their problems from other parts, like guys who were not necessarily my soldiers, but other parts of the company I would be with or other parts of the areas I'd be with, they would get catch wind and they would come talk to me. And then guys who were trying to get girls in their life would come talk to me as well. And so that kind of grew into doing a lot of counseling and doing doing one-on-one -on -one work with soldiers. At the same time, too, I was really interested in mental health. I'd gone to university for psychology. I was interested in behavioral psychology. I got into more of the success, um, psychology of success with neurolinguistic programming, hypnotherapy. I got interested in helping guys with trauma like PTSD or anxiety or, or those types of things through EMDR therapy. I used all of these modalities on myself. And then I thought, well, I could get certified in these or learn how to do these for guys that I'm working with that eventually grew into some of my civilian friends wanting me to coach or counsel them. And so in the process, I also have a passion for understanding human behavior, human psychology, particularly relationship dynamics. And so I was reading a lot too, evolutionary psychology, those sorts of things. I was also figuring myself out. I have my own fair share of bad relationships and bad decisions that I made with women. And now I make better decisions with women consequently from doing all that research. And so it all kind of came together and I got back from Afghanistan and other deployment. I'm not active duty. I'm like part-time now reserve status. And I got back uh, from Afghanistan in May and started Apex Mindset more officially Although I was doing things off and on, just on, on the side, I actually started a company with it. And that's where I'm at today. I'm counseling and uh, coaching lots of guys to have six, better success in their life, to get a better mindset, get rid of anxieties, get rid of issues, but also have better relationships with women. I do coach mostly men, but I do have, I would say anywhere from 15 to 20% of my clients are women. So, and that's an interesting dynamic. I've had women of all ages from as young as 18. I don't do under 18 just because I don't, it's a whole kid dynamic there, but 18, 19, 20 year old girls into women who are in their forties I've had as, as clients. So that's my okay, intro. Yeah. 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 The reason I found, well, there's two reasons why I found your channel interesting and, and I'd like to have this discussion going. First of all is that on what you describe, the relationship between men and women, whether it's dating, whether it's a couple, whether it's marriage, married life, 
I found that you have, contrary to many in today's uh, either pickup artist or um, you know this black pill or red or red pill or uh, men going their own way and so on, you seem to have a very positive attitude to to be constructive in the understanding of the dynamic of both women and men and also their relationships. You are not there to to um, disappoint or or demotivate people or on the contrary you you've and especially on women because i was raised to put women on a pedestal which is probably too much but um i was certainly not raised and i don't agree with looking down on women for who they are biologically because they're different from men and i think right. and, and i think in your channel you look at women and men on their positive sides well actually on who they are whether it doesn't matter what's positive or negative it's a subjective you look yeah. at them on who they are and you teach people to improve the odds the chances to fit better and to build something that is meaningful and and functional and and i found that very very interesting i'll tell the second reasons uh, after but maybe sure. maybe you'd like to tell us more about this and concepts like the green flag con and so on that I found really interesting in your in in what you say in your channel. Um, yeah, sure, love to expand on that. So, the well for starters, and this is kind of a success mindset thing as well, is I always want to look at things more new, neutrally first. So I'm not going to put any judgment on on what the objective reality is first. I just want to see it for what it is. I'm not going to put judgment on it. I'm not going to, you know, immediately go, oh, this is bad or this is good. I just want to see what the reality is. And then from there, I can decide, is this useful or, you know, for me and for other people around me, or is this not useful perhaps? And then I move towards what's going to be what I want. So it's always a question of, well, what do I really want here? And, and that's, really a success focus or success mindset. I didn't have the luxury on missions where things got very serious. I'll mention one incident just here. Um, we were in it. I can't say the area. Okay. But uh, we were in an area of the world where there were a lot of people that would want to kill us. Okay. And we were pulling reconnaissance and gathering intelligence meaning figuring out where the bad guys and potential terrorists were and what type were their caching weapons. We ended up in an area where we were just four of us were basically taking pictures and getting all of the Intel on the ground, but we ended up getting too far in and we were surrounded by potential enemy combatants that would kill us if they found us. And we were just kind of hunkered down and surrounded on all angles and we had to figure out our way out. Had we have been caught or found, we, I wouldn't be on this show with you. We, we would probably be dead. Now it didn't end in a very climactic firefight, thankfully, because I would be dead. <laughs> okay. It would, we were way outnumbered. There's only four of us. I would be, you know, a silver star, maybe recipient or some, I have some really cool award for my grave. We don't want that. So I had to, um, figure out we none of us in that, that that situation and this is how we were trained went oh my gosh we have all these people we're surrounded we're screwed we're in trouble the situation looks really bad okay no that's not what we had the luxury to do we just had to look at okay what's the situation i got enemy vehicles here i got these guys over here i got this that the other here's our route here's our way out we can get this way if we go this way we can do this quietly without being seen, go around about and get back to a safe area. Okay, cool. Let's do it. And then we execute. That's it. It was all about the goal and getting to the goal. There was no doom and gloom about what else was going around us. I thought later on, well, if I apply that same psychology to other things I want in life, focus on the goal, focus on, see the reality. So don't delude myself and pretend that you know, things aren't the way that they are, see the reality for what it is. And now I can navigate that landscape to get to where I want to go. That's exactly what I do with relationships and in the dating market. So a lot of guys will look at certain realities about female nature, certain realities about what we call the global sexual marketplace or the global place 
where people date and do relationships and have all that stuff, right? They have sexual relations. We look at all that stuff and the nature of that is much different than maybe what someone's values might've been 30 years ago or what someone's values were when they grew up or how their mom or dad taught them. And so they look at those differences. Some of those things maybe aren't as favorable when you look at them or aren't as, aren't as good or easy to navigate. And so immediately they start focusing on the problems. And that usually it's not a success mindset. <laughs> That's not going to help them get to what they want. Ultimately, men and women, we want to be with each other and have good relationships with each other. Ultimately, if we didn't care about that, these guys who are doom and gloom, your, your, your black pillars, your MGTOW guys, they wouldn't be all over the internet talking about this stuff. If they didn't care about having relationships with women, they would do what most incel type guys do that aren't on the internet is just, you know, focus on their hobby or whatever, and just move on with their life. But instead they have all this anxiety and some of them have anger and some of them are upset with women. Some of them are misogynistic. Uh, now some will confuse me for being misogynistic, but I'm not, I love women. I have great relationships with women in my life and that's what I promote. Um, but you know, some of these guys jump on some of the negative aspects of things and they, that's, that's all they focus on instead of focusing on the goal and getting to success. The reality is relationships are difficult now because we, the, the technology, the way technology is and the way that society is, it's just different than how we evolved and our brains evolved. So it's harder for us to navigate and, and make things work out well for us. And that's the statistics show that only about 13% of these relationships are happy after the eight year period. That being said, though, here's the good part. We can self-actualize and realize higher level, much better experiences and a higher uh, achieve a higher state of happiness with our partners now than we ever could before because of all this stuff. So with, with all the limitations, there's a lot of advantages too. You know, we have, you have a survival uh, channel and stuff. There's guys who are survivalists in the United States, and I'm not sure how it is with your audience, but a lot of them will go, oh, I wish we didn't have computers. You know, I wish we could get rid of all this technology. It's destroying society. Well, yeah, in some ways it is destroying the way that we used to function. But in other ways, we can use this stuff to our advantage too. So some things are harder and some things are going to be more difficult to handle in, in a problem that we have to solve, but some things we're going to, we're going to be able to do a lot better and, 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 and have a lot better quality of life because of some of these things too. And so it's just a matter of seeing things for the way they are in a balanced way and then making the decisions that are best going to serve you. And, and that's how I approach this stuff. Yep. Uh, oh, there's a lot of things we all wish, but we have to do with reality and was yes. in the situation we are. In uh, you know I'm 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 not I'm, I don't have the experience you have for sure but I'm a, as a hobby I like history and therefore military history is important. Well, I, I I am sure of a lot of situation where you wish to have air support, artillery support, but you don't, and therefore you have to do with what you have. And uh, in relationships, um, uh, indeed, the, the the landscape, the environment has changed over the last twenty years. When when I started dating, I don't know, thirty years ago. Uh, there was no Tinder, there was no uh, Instagram where any good looking girl can have hundreds <laughs> of thousands or millions of yes. uh, people who get who, who give her attention. And mm. therefore, she always thinks that she can get someone better than you. And right. it's very hard for you to sell yourself unless you, you, you really study that. And the good news is, as you say in your channel, we men are uh, result oriented. Therefore, we, we try to find a way. However, we have to be careful, I guess, not to go on the wrong, on the, not to listen to maybe what women tell us, because mm -hmm. they tell us one thing, but they want another. Can you tell yes. us, for example, what is the difference? Because we have terminology like hypergamy, like red yeah. pill, blue pill, alpha, beta. What is the, well, I know, but what does that mean for our audience? Yeah, for our audience. So for our audience, I'm going to actually recommend as a, if you're really interested in understanding this stuff, this is men and also women. I recommend picking up Rolo Tomasi's Rational Male book series. 
Okay. Excellent. He is a, I consider Rolo a, a more of an acquaintance friend. We've yet to meet in person, but I've had great interactions with him and have part worked with him and, and other individuals on uh, some collaboration efforts. His book, his books are, are excellent. They're a little heavy reading for some people. For me, it's not, but, but that's because I'm used to reading really boring scientific <laughs> studies, you know, because that's what I do as a hobby. That's my weird nerd hobby. But, um, but for, for somebody else, it might be a little heavy on the reading, but it, his books have been translated to in other languages. So you can check and see if it's in French for your audience or some of the other languages is more accessible. Not yet, you know, but it, they're good not, in English. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Well, it'll happen. Uh, probably his, I know it's been in a few other languages so far, so it just keeps growing. Now, here's the thing of why I recommend those books, and then I'll get into the terminology. It gives you a foundation of a lot of what has been talked about in these circles. And so it kind of bring you down a path. My path was different. I really didn't link up with him until much later. I knew a lot of the stuff in his first book anyway, um, and his second book too, particularly already before I had looked at it and before we had worked together. Um, but what I liked about what he did is he took a lot of what we have in evolutionary psychology and in behavioral psychology, and he made it applicable to understanding women and understanding female nature. It's a rational male. So the audience is mainly males, although I do think women should read it too. And it's understanding the nature of how we are in a digestible format and then kind of gives us, I don't say an action plan, but a proxology of what kind of actions we can do in order to better our situation with women and, and better our relationships and our interactions. It, it ties, it takes all of this evolutionary psychology stuff that's out there and it puts it in a digestible format. A lot of these terms we use developed in forums and i'll tell you this is how this developed is relationship psychology and like the typical counseling services you would go to for relationship counseling in academia went in a direction where it was very social justice motivated and it was motivated a lot by feminism um the problem with those ideologies, and I know that you're, a lot of your French listeners are very much indoctrinated with that stuff, and they may not even realize it or know it, you know? Well, like, for example, things like gender equality, okay? Gender equality, and this, I'm going to say some controversial things. Hopefully your audience won't hate me too much for it. But men and women are different biologically in how we evolved, because women carried a baby, men did not. So our brain evolution is different. When we look at biology and evolutionary biology, there is no gender equality. There's just some things that women do really well and some things that men do really well based on our evolutionary process. And that's well widely accepted in that little niche or that area. But to talk about these differences, some people feel very threatened by that. Um, because they think that would translate to not giving women opportunity, not giving women equal chances of success on their own. It shouldn't translate to that. And it really doesn't, you know, I, I think that women should have just as many opportunities as men and in order to be successful. And if a woman is more qualified for a job, she gets a job over the guy. Like that's just how it should go. But we have to understand though, biologically in the way our brains work, which includes the way our mating decisions or sexual decisions are made, we evolve differently. And so general academics approach it from we're the same. My psychology program I was in and, you know, different, it was all about us being the same essentially versus recognizing those differences. The problem with that is we know guys that are listening, women that are listening, you know, you communicate differently than your man. <laughs> you know this you know when you guys get into arguments or you guys get into discussions and she's not hearing you or you're not hearing her you're communicating differently because your brains work differently mm -hmm. pick, pick up was more pick, so so what you end up having was this whole side sort of rogue side study okay of guys who wanted to like have more sex with women have better relationships with women some of those guys of course had more uh, less morally good motives. Some of those guys are not necessarily good people. Okay. And some of those guys are fine. They're good people. It's just all difference, but they wanted to have these understand women better 
and the scientific community wasn't handling it in the way that they could do it. So they started forums. They got involved in a pickup artistry. They started figuring out some of the stuff and coming up with ideas. Some of the ideas are really dumb and not true. Some of them are pretty darn good though, when mm -hmm. you connect some of these dots. And, and so Rolo it, Tomasi was the author of Rational Mail. And a lot of these guys were in these forums developing these ideas. That's where these terms come from, like alpha, beta, um, you know, I, I mean, we could think of what, what other terms, but one itis, I don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hypergamy. Yeah. So he expanded and that's why I have to give him the credit for a hypergamy thing. So hypergamy was a term in sociology. Um, I remember reading and hearing about it because I am a, again, I'm very much, my nerd hobby is reading a lot. Uh, anything, anything social sciences, I read a lot about that stuff. Um, I remember seeing about it seeing the word hypergamy when it came to class structures, I think it was developed some time in the fifties. It, it was applied to India where they talked about social classes and what they had noticed with hypergamy was that men would often marry down in a social class, meaning they would find a hot girl that was in a lower social class and they would swoop her up and have her make babies and make them the wife or make her or his wife. You know what I mean? No problem. Right. But women rarely made it downward in social class, they were always looking to mate upward. So this idea of mating upward came, became a big long term called hypergamy. Hypergamy was used to describe a, a woman's tendency, not a man, men are not hypergamous, okay, according to the definition, a woman's tendency to always mate upward. Mm -hmm. Well, Rollo expanded that definition and I agree with his expanded definition because when we observe evolutionary psychology, we realize now Roll is not the only person who thinks this. There's other evolutionary psychologists who think this as well, but they might not use the term hypergamy for it. But we realize that we are survived. We survived today as a species and are thriving because women always made it upward, but not just, or, or try to, that was their goal anyway, mm -hmm. but not just because of social status or money or economics. It was because that was all a part of it, but it would also be because of alpha traits, physically dominant, mentally dominant traits. So guys who are more be dominant, better leaders, more socially influential, more physically fit, taller, stronger. Women wanted to mate with those guys because if they made it upward, the baby that would come out of them would be a better genetic specimen than if they made it downward. Okay, so our when you look at selfish gene theory, Dawkins, and you look at, yep. you know, gene theory that we want to propagate our genes and create better species forms of our species moving forward instead of worse, because worse would lead to us not surviving eventually. This is women control the mating in that sense. And women chose men and still choose men today that they perceive as better than they are on a genetic level. And so the word hypergamy went beyond class and got looked at in terms of a lot of all of the other characteristics as well. Finances, looks, you know, uh, physical traits, mental traits. And that's where we get into the term alpha beta. It's just kind of a catch-all term. We, 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 there's more of a definition of it when we deal with animal kingdom, wolves and chimpanzees. Sure. But, we're, but we're really not that far off from the society of chimpanzees. We're not too far off. Uh, my assessment, and this is me, not necessarily Rolo, but my assessment is the re what makes the difference between our social circles. You look at an author, by the way, named Francis de Wall. Francis mm -hmm. de Wall was one of the first people to apply the word alpha and beta to, at least he's credited with that, in a book called Chimpanzee Politics, 1980s. And he, he's a um, primatologist. Yes. And he, you know, so he, he would recognize, he was making the comparison of chimpanzee social dynamics and how that applied to human beings. Really interesting work. And we can see that in our society today that you have men that are just more dominant than other men and then women want to mate with those men. Okay. What makes us different than chimpanzees? There's a number of things, but one of the things socially, right, is that we manage several different social circles or different layers of social circles. So I have my 
social circle at work at the office, right? Or maybe I'm the dominant man there, right? And I'm the boss, people listen to me, I'm the team leader or something. And then I leave and I go home and I go home to my wife. And Maybe I'm not so dominant at home. Maybe I've been conditioned to kind of be a little bit weaker and placate to her and all this. So she doesn't see me as a dominant guy or even as sexually uh, marketable. She doesn't see me as this guy, even though I'm that guy at the office. And then maybe I go into my jujitsu class or my racquetball class and I'm only like an average player there. So from that social circle, I'm in the middle somewhere, but then somebody else is more socially dominant. So we are managing different layers of dominance hierarchies. Jordan Pierce, Peterson talks about jo- uh, dominance hierarchies, but what I don't know that he's recognizing exactly is that there are these are managing these. It's not just one on one thing like gorillas. Gorillas have their tribe. Chimpanzees have their little tribe. They're not going to work to their accounting job later. You know what I mean? So they have one social circle to manage and because they're not complex socially and they only manage one social circle, there's more violence and territorialness. Now we have violence and territorialness too. However, we have been able to thrive as a species because alpha males can collaborate together. So this is why, and some people don't understand that it is not like we get in a social circle. I don't believe it's, Oh, well, there has to be one person that's the most dominant in the circle. Not necessarily like, for example, like let's use, you had Rich Cooper on this channel, right? And he's, so Rich Cooper has his own social circle. I have my own social circle. They don't intersect necessarily. You know, his don't intersect. We come together. We're two alpha males coming together, collaborating. I'm not like going below him or anything. He's not going below me or anything like that. There's things that he is way better at me at, which is why I use him for entrepreneurial coaching because he's an excellent business guy and it would be good for entrepreneurial stuff, you know? But if he wants to learn how to employ a machine gun, he's probably going to have to call me. And so it's, we can collaborate and not fight each other as alpha males. And that's a benefit to obviously the way we've developed as human beings. But back to the sexual marketplace stuff, women are generally choosing the most capable alpha guys to want to mate with. That's who they're sexually attracted to. That's who they want to have babies with. That's what gives them the tingles and makes them swoon and makes them want to go have a really hot sexual experience somewhere that maybe be a little bit dangerous, you know? Mm -hmm. Now guys with beta traits though, guys with beta traits might be the kind that would placate to the woman and want and I'm being very binary here in my thinking. Obviously, there's there's many levels to this with this particular human, but the, the traditional beta guy, she might take that guy because he's a good dad. He makes good money. He has good resources. He's a nice guy. He's pleasant to be with, but then she's not that sexually attracted to him because he's not the alpha male. And that's the dynamic we figured out with evolutionary psychology. There's a term called uh, strategic pluralism. Yeah. which we've noticed in the animal kingdom and applies to, you know, human beings as well, which is a woman would rather mate with the highest, best genetic option she can find. The alpha guy who is dominant, who's got the leadership skills, physical qualities, all the stuff, but then also is willing to take care of her, is nurturing, would care for the baby, would not cheat on her and throw her aside for another woman when she gets older, those things, right? A woman wants that guy, but those guys are very rare. Those guys out of alpha guys, those guys are even smaller percentage. So if we're thinking 20% of men are more alpha dominant than the rest of the guys, 80% more being more beta, women want to sleep with and have sex with that top 20%. Well, out of that top 20%, even smaller percentage of those guys are actually not jerks, <laughs> right? Are actually good guys to pair bond with and have a family with only a small percentage of those guys. So as a, as a solution to this evolutionary problem, women will settle with a guy that they're less sexually attracted to. And that's that strategic pluralism. This does work for procreating and having babies, but it doesn't work for actualizing a wonderful, happy relationship long-term that because she's settling with somebody she's not that excited about, 
the guy is being conditioned to say, hey, you know, you're never really going to be this alpha guy. So those alpha guys are actually not good people. They're not someone you want to be like. You want to be this nice guy. You want to, you know, you want to be a pushover. Let her be the boss. Let her tell you what to do, you know, and, and, and guys are being uh, demasculinized, right? Their, their, their masculinity is being taken away from them by society so that they'll be the nice guy to take care of the baby. The problem is, though, the women are not attracted to that guy, maybe short term or in moments, but not long term. They don't want to stay with that guy. So they become unhappy. So now you have all these women that are unhappy in relationships, <laughs> you know, because they've settled with a guy they're not happy with. They want this other guy, but maybe that guy's a jerk sometimes. And maybe that guy's kind of hard to deal with sometimes. Right. And maybe he's not a good person to take care of babies. So it's hard for women to find that balance. My, my, my channel is designed to help men be that balanced alpha man, be, be the guy who's an alpha guy that she wants to be with, that she would be happy with long-term or short-term even, but that he would also be a, a person who would take care of a kid well and, and who would be benevolent and have good values. That's the kind of men I'm, I'm hoping to build with my channel. And I'm hoping that women can be the type of woman that would be good match for that guy, you know, because a lot of women, just like there's a lot of men who have a lot of problems and are not good in relationships, a lot of women who are not good in relationships too. And so, you know, I, I hope women listen to what I'm saying, even though some of it may be critical on female nature sometimes, but so what? I'm critical on male nature too. You know, like there's things men do that aren't good and that we need to not do that stuff. Well, actually yeah. uh, listening to you, as a, as a, as a, just a simple listener, I don't find I don't find you to be critical. You just find I think you're descrip describing how it is, and and where the the flaws and and that, well the, the advantages and disadvantages from that nature come in as they interact with other. Because here's here's a you know I'm not surprised that we both like uh, evolution, evolutionary psychology, but basically you have three big phases in human evolution. You have a human as Homo sapiens. You have, um, and um, uh, I, I'm not homo, but I, I'm not homo <laughs> sapiens, but I have friends who are. <laughs> okay, and, and you have, you know, when we, when we used to be hunter-gatherers for maybe 90% of the time we were on, 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 on Earth, and I'm not talking before, I'm just taking, you know, the last 200,000 years. Well, basically, we were living in groups of maybe 40, 50 uh, people, and any girl or any boy who came on age to be reproductive, so men went to, through rites of passage to become adults and be allowed to, to find a, a woman or wife. Uh, and girls, well, obviously, they, they become women as, as they know they are becoming a woman. Mm. Uh, they probably have to choose every year between maybe five or six potential mates. So the, 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 or for the woman, someone who just lost his wife through birth, through childbirth. So mm -hmm. basically the choice is pretty limited. You can choose someone roughly your age or one or two years older, or you can, you can look for this experience, experienced hunter. So which, which might be slightly poly polygamous, but not too much because there's not a lot of women to go around. Right. And if you can't find someone in that group, you have to hope that the next time your group meets another group, um, you find that, first of all, that group is, is pretty friendly with you. Maybe it's cousins, it's uncles from that generation before who split and moved to some other land to find, to find better, better hunting grounds. And, and eventually you are traded in. Say the guy says, well, look, I really like that, that, that woman of yours. The woman says, oh, finally, a man that is available. And the guy says, okay, here's some, here's some tools and some stuff. And can I get your, your daughter? And you say, yeah, okay. And, and it bonds the, the tribes together as, mm -hmm. as they grow across the world. Simple, but yet the same psychology system works. You're, the woman wants the best guy possible, but the choice yes. is very different. Second yeah. phase comes civilization. It's the other 10% of, of the time, which is from 50,000 BC agriculture, to roughly 50 years ago, where you're settled in. Survival is still pretty tough. In fact, it's even tougher because you have illnesses, you have, uh, you have stuff that didn't exist before. And suddenly uh, you have much more um, death rate and, and you have a tendency which is higher to, to, to uh, polygamy for men because the rulers, the kings, the, the, the lords, they can have three, four, 10, 
50 men, 50 women, and you have a lot of single men who, are, who have to find women elsewhere. And so it becomes much more aggressive. It becomes much more warlike. Mm -hmm. and, but still, the choice is limited. You maybe have the choice between 50 potential males and in a city, yeah, much more. And mm -hmm. then you have the last 50 years where suddenly you have the pill. You don't get a baby each time you have sex. Yeah. Or almost each time you have sex. Also, you have more and more communication tools. Uh, you have big cities with millions of people which you can have sex with without tainting your reputation. Because long time mm -hmm. ago, as a woman, if you had sex with everyone, every guy in the village, no one wants to have sex with you anymore. Exactly. Because, because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're the, you don't know if, you, if she's going to bear your, your children. Yeah. Now, in the anonymity, anonymity of the city, women can have as many lovers as they want. No one will ever know. So yes. there's no problem with that revolution. Now, in reality, we know that we tend to keep our circles closed. We know the number, number and so on. But the potential is there. Comes the internet and you have hundreds of thousands of people say, oh, you're pretty, give you a thumbs up from whatever you do, every picture you bring. So yeah. the hypergamy yeah. suddenly has no limit. You're not limited right. to five or 50. You, you have four billion men potentially that you can choose from. Yes. And so this leads you to, I think, as a woman, to do a big mistakes, which is yeah. to keep Huge trying mistakes. to get the best ones. And mm -hmm. therefore, you will end up either having kids with multiple men, which is a disaster. And, and only the, the state, nanny state, will save you from starvation and death, yep. Yep. which makes you unresponsible. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem. Oh, yeah. Or you, you get single until you're 45, and then you're <laughs> desperate. Yeah. And you end up the next 40 years sad and you end up eaten by your cat. Which is <laughs> yes. And, yeah, for the really. men, and for the men, if you, if you don't understand that dynamic, you, you want to have sex as, from 14 onwards. Yeah. And if you can, if you manage, you get with someone roughly your age and eventually she has better market value and she looks for better ones, older, richer and so on. So you get eventually unless you're a super, super incredible guy, and unless you have religion, which has disappeared, you, you, get, you, you, you are sad as a man and you get screwed through the laws from, from, from divorce. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the best man, the, the top alpha guy, the, they get all the women they want mm -hmm. and therefore don't make kids as much as before because they know how not to make kids and so on. So we have a society that is on the verge of, of, of collapse, which is one of my topics in my book. Anyway, I talked a lot. I'm sorry. No, that's so fine. Uh, that's okay. That's good. But, but the point I'm, I'm, I'm driving to, and, and this is where my audience, who are mostly people who prep or are survivalists, um, mm. they often have this concern that part of, part of, in my books, I have seven pillars that make you successful survival. One of mm. them is the social network that you build including yes. which probably the most important is the one you have with, with your partner, with your spouse or husband. And if you don't succeed in that, you're into a lot of trouble, in, especially as times become difficult. Yes. So the, the question is, knowing all that evolution, knowing the skills you have, knowing having the knowledge you have on women and men and their dynamic, how would you say that people who prepare for difficult times, and difficult times are definitely here, they are, that's it. They're already here. Yeah, uh, and, and and how can they work to make sure that the man is generally desired by by their spouse and woman, and 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 for the woman that they find the man that is both attractive and desirable, but also responsible, so that he takes care of her. Because sure. these two things have to fit. Anyway, I talked a lot. I let you. I let no, you, no, that's good. You. Um, I I wish. Uh, we could, I, I say, I wish, because I, I have, it's, this is a little controversial in our circles, the red pill type circles, but I am thinking about, I may even try it. And it may be a huge catastrophic failure that I'll get to laugh about, but I'm thinking about starting a channel maybe for women 
even though I'm going to be a man, mansplaining it to them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so there's going to be definitely a humor element to it because sure. who wants to hear a guy, especially a guy like me, um, maybe uh, explain to women what they need to do to be happy. That being said, though, um, I think there's a shortage of that. The men that are doing that or trying to do that are popular. What they're doing is they're placating to, I would call, with, with hope no one takes offense to the term, but the feminine ego. They're not presenting reality. They're not presenting hard truths. They're presenting feel-good information so women can feel good about their bad decisions. And when I say bad decisions, I don't mean decisions like I'm judging you on some moral level. But if you want to have, uh, here's a great example is pair bonding. If you want to be in a happy relationship that is close and emotionally uh, close and developed with a person that a man that's going to be there for you. And if times do get tough, you know, you can, you can have resources together. He is willing to take care of you. If you, you know, need to be taken care of and so on. You want that close, tight relationship. Most women dream about that when they're little girls. They don't dream about having a harem of boyfriends. They dream about Prince Charming, right? And so well, if a girl wants that, you can't do what the global sexual marketplace has them doing, which is having ca a lot of casual sex with a lot of different people, a lot of different experiences. Um, this is some women hate this when I talk about it because they can't handle things like consequences. Uh, and, and I'll say that about some men too now too, right? It's people hate consequences for their actions, but women need to recognize that everything you do in the global sexual marketplace has a consequence. Some of those will be good consequences. Some of those will be bad. Some of those will feel good now, but hurt you or make things complicated for you later. And so when women are told by feminist ideology to go explore their sexuality with many different men when they're young, that compromises their ability to be with one guy and be happy long-term. That's a problem. And so like, that's a problem because they're also being told, well, you're beautiful no matter what age you are. I'm not going to say that women aren't beautiful, or whatever, but I'm going to say we need to, to face the facts that a sexually attractive woman is going to be more sexually attractive at 22 years old for the most part than when she's 42 years old. Her ability to get a man with resources who's that guy that they would really want to be with goes down every year they get older. Now, if anyone in your audience is a woman who's in her 40s, your hope's not lost. I'm not trying to tell you it's hopeless for you, okay? But that is a reality that we need to, for society's sake, we need to illustrate that. That 40-year-old woman in your audience right now that's single for whatever reason, got divorced, something happened, I mean, she can be happy, but she's going to have to do a lot more work and it's going to be a lot more difficult and the, and, the, and the probabilities aren't as good for her as a girl who's 21 years old starting her life. So you want to take your 21 year old good genetics and squander them away by, you know, sleeping with guys that don't care about you and doing really stupid stuff that's going to affect you later. And I'm not, I'm not approaching this from some moralistic religiously motivated angle I'm, I'm approaching it from the angle of what do you want for long-term success long-term happiness again just like being in that uh, situation i mentioned in combat where i'm not going to look i'm going to see things the way they are and then go towards what my ultimate goal is a woman needs to ask herself what's my goal and move towards that and a woman needs to recognize too especially these young girls that people are going to lie to you when you're 21 years old men by and large are going to lie to you Yes. that's just the way it is they're they're, they're gonna yeah. lie to you that's a negative thing on people who think only talk negative about women there's a negative thing on guys guys you're a bunch of liars as soon as she comes in and she looks pretty lies fall out your mouth because because you know you just see you see a tool that you can mate with and then it's right and so this 21 year old girl is going to get showered with attention and bs and feel good information she's not going to be told the truth and, and then she's going to be trying to navigate the world and make decisions based on a lot of misinformation. That's not good. So women need to be conscious of that and they need to understand it. Women need to understand that there's because of evolution, not because they're bad people, 
that there's a deceptive nature of their sexual desire because they were the physically weaker sex and men in the past. And even today, if you go somewhere like Afghanistan, will kill you if you're honest about your desires. If you're honest about your desires in Afghanistan, you'll get killed as a woman. That's the reality. So to combat that, they've learned to be deceptive and to lie a little bit to themselves even about what their desires are, what they want. When a woman's falling for that beta guy that they're not excited with and they're settling down and they got cold feet when they're going to the altar, they really don't want to marry him. And then she tells herself another story to get to be able to do it. She doesn't have that burning desire for this guy that she did for the alpha guy that she had a fling with on summer, some summer vacation or something, right? She doesn't have that maximum desire, but she's lying to herself so she can get married and execute a strategic pluralism strategy for herself. So recognizing and understanding our genetic drives allows us to not BS ourselves, not lie to ourselves, whether we're men or women. So those are some of the things women need to be aware of, be on board with, and not be so judgmental about the information. Guys need to not be judgmental about the information, but women too. Don't look at it like, Oh, what do you mean sleeping with multiple people ruins my neurochemical reaction for pair bonding? Oh, I'm going to judge that because I slept with too many people when I was 21 and I don't want to face that, that, that stuff. No, that's not going to help you. And, you know, if you did go through a promiscuous phase of your life, there's things you could probably do to try to reverse that stuff. I mean, it's no guarantees, but certainly would be better to work on that and work on your ability to pair bond than to pretend that that doesn't exist. And then marry some guy you're not happy with and then be in a situation that you're miserable. And then you're trying to cheat with some guy somewhere else who has better resources or whatever it may be. You know what I mean? Women are just going through lives unhappy. Guys are too. And guys well, yeah. are too. And so, so yeah, these are recognizing these truths in a neutral way and then figuring out, okay, now what do I do to navigate this? I'm blessed. I feel honored that I've had, it's not very many. It's not like I had hundreds of young women contacting me or anything, but I've had two or three. Well, no, actually, oh, you say. And so <laughs> I say, well, they're contacting me for other things, but for, I've had a small handful of women want to, that are young, like 19, 20, 21. They haven't like ruined their, they haven't gone through major, like screwed themselves up. They see what their peers are doing. They see how their parents aren't happy their friends aren't happy. Like they, they have short-term happiness when they have, you know, sleep with some guy at a party or they, you know what I mean? They do some whatever crazy sexual stuff, but they're not actually happy and they can see the long-term stuff and they don't know what to do about that. And then they hear some of the things I say and they go, well, tell me more. I want to know the truth. You know, it's, it's a very small amount of women that have, have done that, but man, I'm honored. It's, it gives me hope, you know, that a young girl who's let's say 19, 20 years old would say, how do I do this? How do I navigate this so I can be happy long term, not just do what my friends are doing, which is take all the attention from men and feel really cool, feel really good about it, get intoxicated, sleep with a few guys or whatever, and then pick up the pieces later when I'm 30. You know what I mean? How do I, how do, I do this the right way where I can be happy now and happy later? Pretty cool. And so more women need to do that stuff. And more women who did bad decisions need to be okay to recognize, hey, you know what? You're not a bad person for doing some of the bad decisions you made. That means that you're just somebody who made bad decisions. So you're, you're a better person if you're honest about that to yourself and to younger girls that are coming up like, hey, don't do what I did. This is not a good idea, right? More people would do that, we would do a lot better. And, and men too can stop trying to protect women from themselves, give women a little bit of, of respect that they're human beings with agency and they can handle their own stuff and stop trying to protect them by not wanting to look at any of this negative, like women are deceptive. I don't want to look at that. Right. Or whatever. And, and start looking at the reality for how things are and start learning how to show up and be a dominant alpha option. If guys knew, know how to um, show up that way, they're going to do better. You know what the solution is for the global sexual marketplace. So here's the, the good news that the light at the end of the green flag, right? Is that um, we're also with all this evolution for the ability to protect our resources, 
for the need to handle resource protection in scarce environments. We move from hunter gatherer, short term gratification style living, which killed us at age 30. Okay. On average, we moved into being able to live forties and fifties and sixties. Now people are living past in their mid eighties is like the average for most of the first world. We live a long time. And with that, we've developed a different strategy from just indiscriminate polyamorous sex, which is we've developed a pair bonding strategy in order to survive making it into old age, you know, and being able to continue to raise families and grandchildren and all that into old age, the ability to pair bond and the ability to have peak experiences with your partner that negates all of the attention from the sexual marketplace. I have a, a, a what we call an LTR, right? Long-term relationship. My woman is in her twenties. She's younger than I am. Right. And she's, she grew up, she was born after 1990. So that means she grew up in the global sexual marketplace where if she gets on her Instagram, she gets on her Facebook, all of the people who are better looking than me, <laughs> who make more money than I do, who are, I'm pretty physically fit, man, but there's other physically, more physically fit, right? All the better guys and better choices are out there to stimulate her hypergamy on the internet. Guys are dropping in her inbox and stuff. Well, she doesn't signal very much, so she doesn't get so much of that anymore, but it sure happens. She also is in a very social job. She, when COVID restrictions and pandemic restrictions aren't here, she bartends a couple of nights a week along with doing, uh, working in an office with insurance. So her bartending job, she is inundated with men who maybe might have characteristics, might, if she's in a fight with me or something, maybe another guy comes along, right? And she has that hypergamous brain that is somebody better than Paul that can be tickled. But you know what? It isn't tickled. She doesn't even look at any of those people. She doesn't even see them. They're like furniture her. Why is that? She's a pair bond with me. She retained her ability to pair bond. She didn't screw herself up. She didn't run into all kinds of baggage from emotional damage and stuff that she did when she was younger. She did some dumb stuff for sure. No question, but she was very lucky. And she's also somebody who worked on herself. A lot of women and men don't work on themselves. They don't work on making themselves more mentally and emotionally stable. She recognized she had a couple of a, epiphany moments in her mid twenties and recognized that her lifestyle was not the best and that she needed to make some changes. And she worked on herself no different than I work on myself, you know, and now she's able to be with me and be non-toxic and be a, a good functional partner for with me. And, and she has the neurochemicals. This is neurochemical. She gets the oxytocin, the vasopressin, the dopamine, the serotonin, all of those needs and fixes met from the bond she has with me. And then on top of that, there is a utilitarian aspect of hypergamy, meaning I need to show up and perform as a man, burn a performance on me. So yeah. I am showing up and performing and I am showing up and being her best option too. And I'm creating with her experiences that are just amazing and euphoric. And we have great feelings with these experiences and these are experiences she's never experienced before. This is both sexually and in the bedroom, right? As well as outside of the bedroom. And so that right there, especially by the way, in the bedroom, and I'm not going to get too, we'll keep it censored and clean for your channel, but all of the attention in the world from guys on Instagram will not compete with a bond you have in the bedroom with somebody. If you make that a peak experience and if it's a good experience, it won't compete with that. But you can't compete with that. That's as close as you can get with somebody. Yeah. And so those experiences, as well as the wonderful experiences and times we have on a daily basis and the connection we have that bond, that pair bond and her seeing me and me showing up as her apex alpha. Okay. That solves any of the problems the global sexual marketplace has. So for men in my channel, if you guys go to apex mindset, it's in English. So <laughs> it is, but apex mindset on YouTube, that's what I'm helping guys do. I'm helping guys pick women, choose women who can pair bond, who haven't ruined that ability. They're not toxic. They don't have mental health problems and they can actually pair bond. They're able to, and 
women who, you know, to show up and be that apex alpha for that woman and for yourself, for that matter. It's not even for her. You do it for you, but she sees that and is attracted to that, has the most desire for that. It doesn't matter what's on Instagram after that. You know what I mean? That becomes the outside world. She sees the outside world for the emptiness that it is and the loneliness that it actually is. And her hypergamous brain gets stimulated and solved every time she looks at you. That's the answer to the stuff. That's the answer that the doom and gloomers are missing and they need to not miss that. And, and it takes work. We have to work on that. And on the woman's side, don't do things that will destroy your ability to bond with a guy later. That's the biggest thing you can do and work on yourself and your ability to be in a relationship with someone. If I'm a young girl or a young girl, I'm not going to say if I'm a young girl, that's weird, but a young girl, you know, if she is just having casual sex everywhere, partying and screwing around, she's not going to turn around when she's 28 years old and go, okay, I'm going to go be in a relationship now and get married. Relationships are hard work for men and for women. Yes. So she needs to be developing, you know, meaningful relationships with men, learning about how men communicate. We have to learn how women communicate as men in order to, you know, have a functional, good relationship with them. Women, they need to learn how men communicate to show up and be his best option for a mate choice, because as hot as she might be, that hotness is based in youth. And even if she takes care of herself and goes to the gym, that youth is going to decline in his willingness to stay with her when she's 30, when he could get a 21 year old or when she's 35 or when she's 40, it's going to be the pair bond. And it's going to be because she shows up in the relationship as her best self. That doesn't happen on accident. You got to work on that. And so screwing around, partying, doing drugs and, you know, doing and getting and, and having a bunch of dudes around isn't going to help you with that, <laughs> you know? And so that's the advice to everybody it, it, in, a, in a survival, especially now, especially now where things are uncertain, you're going to thrive much better with, but with good relationships with the opposite sex, you know, and, and, and that you, this is what it requires. So exactly. <laughs> So I remind your, your website and I will put the link below. Um, perhaps the last question. And um, before that, you, you probably don't know, but one of my books, not the most successful one, I must say, uh, mm -hmm. was on, on how women should prepare. Oh, wow. Times ahead. The, the title is a woman on the verge of societal breakdown, which is a long mm -hmm. title. But basically in it, I, I really, now that I listen to you, I, 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 I took it from the historical perspective and the sociological perspective, not the relationship one. But certainly there is a, a link where, I've, in, the, in the book I explain why the, the uh, I call the 20th century, the, the century of women, where they gained so much freedom and rights and, and, and uh, they could vote, they could uh, divorce, they could uh, do anything uh, that they wanted. And they even mm. went very ahead economically. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, this was possible because of the, the wealth, the, the comfort, the, the peace that was created throughout, throughout that century uh, at high cost, and mostly for men, but at very high cost. Yep. And, um, and now that we're entering what I think is going to be a very uh, high turmoil uh, century, for sure, very high risk and, and difficult, difficult times, uh, having those relationships for both women and men, of course, on that book, I focused on women, as you just said, is um, not only good for your happiness and long-term uh, uh, peace of mind and peace of being and so on, but it's also quite good for your literal survival because mm -hmm. as, as you've seen, um, and, and you've been in Afghanistan or in other Arabic country, they, they just didn't come up with this idea of having women to be enslaved just because it's also because of the environment and the, the way tribes uh, are connected to each other or not, or fighting each other, where women are prizes and you could, uh, so you have codes where if the woman has any, anything showing, <laughs> they're completely covered, uh, well, yeah. it means that she could be stolen by someone else. And, uh, and that's a precious um, asset for any family, any tribe, because she bears oh, children, yeah. of course, but also she takes care of the children and, she takes care of a lot of things as well for the men. And, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it's a survival mechanism, probably 
to the extreme on, on one level, whereas on, on our societies, we went to the extreme on the other. But societies change. And Afghanistan used to have a time where it was free for women, it was, it was, it was liberal. Mm. And, and, and we used to have times where it was not that liberal. As, as economies will get difficult, uh, I remind in those books that for many, many centuries in the big cities such as London, uh, I don't know, Dublin, Ireland, or, or, or Naples in Italy, or, or, or like something like 40% of women were prostitutes. Yeah, Because oh yeah, that's interesting. Make, just that was the only way to make do and, 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 mm -hmm. and get another head ahead, another day ahead, perhaps feed one or two children. It was a miserable, difficult life. Now, if sure. women listen to us, um, I know that some women enjoy the job of, of prostitutes, but the right. majority don't, especially no. if you have to do it for food, not just, uh, not just uh, money. Right. And, um, and, and so when the world becomes difficult again, you know, beware that this is the job that cities and the, and, and has for women. So you have to really think hard that this is not just, oh, I want to be happy and not end up eaten alone and eaten by my cat in my flat. This, yeah. is, really, this is really because you, you, you end up selling the only asset you have if you, if you don't, uh, if there is no protection, if there is no bonds, if there's no men around. Sure. Uh, and Or then, someone will right. take that if no one is there to protect. Someone will take that from these women. This is where incidents of sexual assault, rape, yeah. and things like that skyrocket in places that there's less police yes. protection less societal protection absolutely unfortunately yep. and and we, we we condemn that of course because you never know with people on, in, on the internet listening to us we condemn that big time. oh of course we do yeah absolutely but it could happen and therefore yeah. we want to avoid that and one way to avoid it is to perhaps not collapse society but this is not under our control <laughs> would, but what is under good. our control is to make these bonds and, and you're helping them to that. So yeah. was there even a question? In, in I don't know, but you know what? I'll spin off that for a second. I will say, sure. because I, I've had to face as a military person who, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm global. I'm global in the sense that I have a lot of respect for other countries in the world and the way that they do things. I'm not one of those egotistical Americans that shows up somewhere and demands everything because I'm American, which happens everywhere. You know, that's I, some places in the world I have to lie and say I'm Canadian because that's going to be the assumption. But anyway, um, that being said though, I, I, um, although I have respect for all, a lot of countries and how countries do things and different cultures, um, I have been, not overly patriotic, but the principles that the, the good principles United States was built upon things like individual rights and freedoms, the ability to pursue, you know, um, happiness and, and economic freedom and some of those things, things that did not exist and doesn't exist in other places. I do believe in those things. And right now in the United States, those things, things are under attack. We're very much in conflict. I'm sure your audience is familiar with what is going on right now in the United States. We are, we are recording this on the 21st of January. So 21st. Yeah. Uh, uh, so 21st day of the first months of the 21st year of the 21st century. Right. So when everything collapses, it'll be somewhere in the archives. But um, <laughs> well, yeah. the thing Having so, I, I just protected and and put myself on the line to protect innocent people in my mind from those who'd want to take those things away, whether it was in another country or just fighting for those principles. Whatever, didn't question things too much though. But now that there's all of this unrest, caused me to question, look at things, and the biggest problem with it is um, that I see as a problem is a censorship of ideas done through corporation and corporate interest in media companies. So my, I have to be careful of the ideas I present because if they're on my YouTube channel, for example, because they're too controversial, instead of being able to have someone who disagrees with me, have a debate with me about it, where we don't call each other names and we just have a debate and maybe I'm wrong and they bring some evidence to the table, which I've had that happen throughout my life. I'm wrong about something and I go, shoot, well, you got me. I'm wrong. Okay. You win. Cool. I changed my, my belief a little bit on this, you know, instead of being able to evolve and develop like rational beings, 
we are being censored. So we can't do that right now because there's people that find ideas threatening. And that is a big, huge problem. It's, it's, it's adding to these, this collapse. So my impact, cause I go to look at it again, what can I do about it? That's what I look at. I can't go and tell people in Washington, DC, the United States to behave themselves. They're not going to listen to me. Right. I can't, there's nothing getting politically active. Won't necessarily do anything. I won't make an impact. Mm-hmm. Too late, but I can make an impact on a couple and how they interact with each other. So if they go through hard times and an economic collapse, they still love each other and they can thrive and do well together. You know, and if I can impact individuals in that level, and if I can talk about controversial ideas in a way that maybe gets past the censorship, you know what I mean? And, and can and can open up people's mind because right now they're getting censored information that keeps their ways of thinking in a little a little box that might not be good for them. That's my impact. And everybody listening, you, I know you yourself, you're making your impact with what you're doing. Everybody can think about, okay, what can I do to impact my life and other people around me, my tribe, in order to have success through all the stuff I can't control. People do that and focus on that versus attacking each other on Facebook or, you know, uh, doing some of the things people yeah, do. I the, think we'd be a lot the, better off. The, the sad thing is that, by the way, on censorship, and I, and I'm, I, I, I completely agree with that I used to work, of course, I worked 20, 20 years in, in the software industry before, before writing books and doing what I'm doing now. And, and that industry, as many others, thrived because you could throw in ideas, you could throw in uh, concepts, you could throw in uh, opportunities. And if they didn't listen, you could start your own and you could be uh, mm-hmm. successful or not. And also through history, there are so many examples of countries who basically decided, Japan, let's close the country down for foreigners and let's stay in medieval times so that when the, the, the American fleet comes in, we have no way to resist. China, let's shut down our fleets and shut down uh, trade with the rest of the world and let's focus to be the same and not move. And there the British come in and take over the country and destroy it through opium and and cause millions of death because of that. Uh, The the, the ideas, hey, I know how to do something new. Oh no, the church says that this is, you know, (laughs) The, the earth does not go around the sun. Uh, you are on house arrest and let's not get new technology and you waste years and centuries perhaps. This is common in, in humans, unfortunately. And, and especially, as you rightfully said, in the relationships, we, today, most women, when they look at, at the results of one century of feminism, they're upset and they think, they, they, they show that they say this has failed. And most women don't claim to be feminists at all. They want rights, they want to vote, they want to have the possibility for a job, but they know and they say so. They say, no, it has failed because it, it went too far. It destroyed the dynamic that was successful. It wasn't perfect, but it was successful. And now we have to rebuild. It doesn't mean we go back, we probably can't, but at right. least, we, and you're absolutely right, we can change ourselves in a dynamic of whatever relationship we do have by explanation, by being open, polite, you know, we don't need to be angry. We don't need to be uh, <laughs> cynical. We can, we can do it uh, with open mind and, and, and politely. And, and, and when there is censorship, we have to explain why censorship is, is it doesn't work. And, but sadly, and, and I don't want to finish on a bad note, so I'll let you bounce on that. But <laughs> when you start to, to, to voice, when you start, you, you know history as well, you know, when, when, when governments or groups of people who are dominant, they essentialize you. They say, all Jews are mm. crooked. Therefore, we have to kill them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a longer process than that, but I'm summarizing, <laughs> right. right? Sure, sure. This mm-hmm. happened a few times. Now, yep. uh, all men are toxic, Therefore, they should be enslaved, taxed, and um, whatever. I don't know what they can do, but but I can see this trend, by the way, and it's dangerous. It is very sure. dangerous, and 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 this is the recipe for um, what Maoist China went through, which led to disa- economic and human disasters. So uh, we can change us pe- one by one. You know, one reader, one viewer at a time. And, and both men and women, 
Um, okay, that was very negative. Do you have any secrets <laughs> of that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me, uh, gloomy, uh, not uh, negative. <laughs> <laughs> Doom and gloom. No. Well, here's here's the thing. There is, a, there's a lot of, uh, we could say, societal pullbacks that we've experienced throughout history where people die in large numbers, people get, you know, enslaved in large numbers. But with every one of those incidences, think of it as a deeper form of natural selection. Sure. People came out even more powerful, stronger, and better from that. We don't have the level of slavery and violence that we had a hundred years ago, even mm -hmm. And so we continue to evolve as a species and as a society. Um, we're not out of the weeds because people can and, and are susceptible to violence and danger and enslavement. Economic enslavement is our biggest thing um, that we're looking at, you know, now and an enslavement of ideas as well, not being able to back to censorship, not being allowed to express contrary ideas or else you're deplatformed or you're silenced or some of these things. So these are some big risks now, but the risks we face now are, um, and so I'm, I'm actually part Jewish, right? And so I, I found that out not too long ago because I did genealogy. I had no idea what my That's family okay. was. <laughs> I'm, I'm part Jewish, right? And so like, I'm, I, I'm glad I'm here <laughs> and that my risk is being silenced maybe on YouTube and having to go crap. My business is going to, you know, my consultation business might go, go down for a month or two so I can figure out another platform to get out to people and market to people or start a new channel or do something else. Right. That's my biggest threat now versus being captured by nazis <laughs> and thrown into a camp somewhere and so and so there's there's you know we've evolved as a species we come out on top but even like looking at it so let's take a little story a world war one world war ii story there's a lot of anti-semitism uh, with european jews um, yes. during world war one world two war two period and because of that my grandfather who was half jewish um was smuggled into United States and what he bypassed. Well, so he was, it, it was probably, we're not sure a hundred percent sure, you know? Um, and I don't know that he was smuggled himself. I think the mom was smuggled okay. and was pregnant and then had him in the United States. That's actually how that happened. He was adopted. So we're limited. This is how I, I don't know my genea. I, I know my genealogy, but I don't know a lot of my family. Okay. Mm. Yep. So, so he was adopted, but he then grew to be a prominent business owner in Michigan and Detroit. He was, he was the alpha guy. He was the man's man. He had a family and he had a lot of people he influenced for the better in his location, in his tribe. And he was very intelligent and very resilient from a family history that came out of strife. So abundance and comfort builds weaker men. <laughs> strife and discomfort and 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 having to overcome obstacles builds stronger men and stronger people so people that come to your channel they learn about how to survive and how to make it through this and thrive with what's going yeah, on exactly people who go to my channel and learn how to thrive in relationships yeah. even though there's a lot of reasons maybe not to they're the ones that come out on top and so you have a and what's beautiful about this is that we're not 2000 years ago in biblical times anymore. If you're listening to this channel, you have every opportunity to decide who you want to be. You can be the one who's going to thrive or you can be the person who's not going to thrive. You and I choose to thrive. Hopefully your audience will choose the same. And that's the positive note is that we're in a time in history where we can make the choice and we can, and we can do what it takes and actually be good, be happy. And that's a good thing, right? Excellent way to close the show. <laughs> Paul, awesome. thank you very much. I remind our audience that you should check out uh, Paul's channel, which is Apex Mindset. I'll put the link in the description. And, uh, and of course, check out his consulting. Uh, I think it's really good. Uh, we didn't do it, but uh, we had a discussion and, uh, last, uh, last summer, last fall, and um, actually it did help me a lot. So I, I advise you to try it. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate Thanks you. For Thanks for having me on. And... Uh,